Welcome to It's Your Date with Destiny with Apostle Vivian and Pastor Gemma Duncan of Divine Destiny, Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin. For the next 30 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey of maximizing your potential and realizing your goals through Jesus Christ. Why is it when you need a miracle, it doesn't happen, but when you least expect it, it happens? You are married. You have challenges in your relationship, but your spouse is unwilling to accede to any counseling. Is divorce an option? I'm no How does a parent handle a promiscuous child? A what are considered the do's and, and do's of a born-again so couple who is not yet married? There are always more questions than answers. That so here is Apostle Gemma. A very good morning to you. I'm happy that you took the time to be with me today. And I'm very excited because I'm continuing, as I promised, uh, with the theme of love based on some questions that came to me. And last week I answered, I know I ought to love my spouse, but I feel like I'm running out of ideas. And last week we looked at a number of ways that love could be expressed. Uh, and today we're going to go with question number two, I'll, which I'll tell you after I introduce myself. If you're a first-time viewer, my name is Gemma Duncan. I'm married to Apostle Vivian Duncan, and we are pastors of Divine Destiny Worship Center. Our headquarters is located in Digo Martin, opposite Sardonic Drive on the Digo Martin Main Road. We have a number of branches in Trinidad. We have San Randy, Shogunas, Faisabad. We have a branch in Tobago. We have a baby branch in... Um, Rio Claro, and we have a branch in Antigua in the event of a friend or a family member there. So we're going to go to part two of this discussion. And it says she tells me that I say I love her, but she's not seeing it. Should I stop doing all the things I'm doing and focusing on loving her? A very interesting question, simply because there are times when we say we love her, our spouses, but the truth is we're not actually meeting the need of the person. Um, we do all kinds of a thing. Let me tell you my whole introduction into relationships. I grew up in the country, um, Palo to be exact, and uh, we were taught by word and by action uh, that a good wife was somebody who did all the work on the inside of the house. And generally, a good husband would be the one who would do the outside, <laughs> you know? So you had to be this immaculate housewife and all the cooking and the cleaning and all the stuff like that, taking care of husband and children and so on. And uh, that made you a good wife. However, uh, I did all that they said that I should do. I mean, to the point that, and not only that, in the country, country women, also go outside the home, you know, it's not as if because the husband expected to do like big, big gardening. And, but the woman does the kind of light garden around, little kitchen garden and things like that. So I brought that into our relationship. Um, you know, I mean, every, you, you had fresh bread, uh, you didn't buy bread, fresh bake. Um, you had make cake every weekend, I made pone. I mean, you name it sweet bread. <laughs> You know, you just name it. Everything was just handmade, you know. Um, all the chips for the children, snacks were made, you know, and so on. And I bagged it, sealed it, so they had plantain chips and uh, um, breadfruit chips and stuff like that. So good, because you expected that's a great wife. Then I made sure the yard was clean and all the drains and this was kept clean and all that. Good wife. It took me a while to realize that I perhaps wasn't really meeting Vivian's needs that despite the fact that I think he enjoyed all of this, I think he loved it, um, I, I, I think he appreciated it, but I'm not sure that is what he needed. That was his number one need. And then uh, I, I came up with the idea that if you're talking about um, doing things for your wife, you, you may just be doing things that didn't just please her because you don't understand what her need is. Um, and our needs vary because um, based on where we come from, um, 
it, 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 it could mean one thing. For example, I grew up poor, right? And poverty pushes you to want things. So generally, um, if you're poor, you're, you're really looking for no poor person too. You know, although people in the village tend to, it happened a lot, these young girls went to, with guys in the village and I mean, you know, the mother squatting and the next thing you do, you build something in the back of the yard, not really. You know, <laughs> um, so you grew up in poverty, you grew up in lack, and you tend to concentrate on things. If I'm going to look for a partner, I'm looking for somebody to supply me with things primarily. That is very important to somebody who lacked, right? And so, uh, so you go into a relationship and that person is providing you with things. What do you find after a while that things don't make you happy? You felt that the, the satisfaction that you expected to get from things you don't get it when you have it. After a while, the house is fine. The maid is clean it, or the helper, for want of a better term. Uh, the pool and the, oh, come on, the travel. Sometimes traveling and all gets a little tiresome if you do it a lot, <laughs> you know. Uh, if every year we go on a nice vacation for July, August, kind of a thing, wonderful. But if every two months after we go on a plane in the airport and all, it gets tiresome. Uh, the jewelry and the bling, how much jewelry you could wear. After a while, you know what, because you're busy, half of the time, most of it stays there. Because by the time I'm ready to get ready, where you have it there, where you have to go look for it, to get it and thing, you just pick up whatever around and you go away, right? So things eventually uh, become normal to you. After years, you know, they don't appeal to you anymore. And so now you're starting to want something else. Now you started that relationship, with your husband thinking that's what you wanted. So he was supplying it and you were in your glee. Suddenly you begin to change and you just don't want things. You want them to stay home, you want time. But for him to give you the things that you wanted, he had to be out of the house. So he's working overtime, double time, triple time to supply you with the things that made you happy. Now you're changing and it creates a problem. So, ah, uh, what it is we need is to find out uh, what are the needs of the person and to understand that sometimes the needs change. For example, um, when we got married, there were a certain amount of dynamics. For example, just two of us, Vivian and I alone, and we did a lot of fun things together. Uh, we had a bag in the trunk of the car with bad suit and uh, um, stuff like that if he felt like going on the beach when he picked me up after school. Uh, we also had a bag with clothes like a weekend if you feel to sleep somewhere and we didn't want to go home so you sleep anyway you go somewhere um, overnight someplace and I mean you can do whatever you want and uh, well now I can say we are both retired if we didn't feel we take the day off and all the next day so you already your bag pack already. <laughs> You go somewhere, ah, uh, you're you overnight. You didn't go to work because it's just in some sea dress or something. So, and you know, you have fun. And then, because I was taught to be that kind of a housewife, he didn't have to help me. He wasn't obligated. And even if he tried to help, in many cases, women would say, "No, no, 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 no. You sit down because you were taught to be this wonderful wife. Sit down. Give him the papers. Bring something for him to drink. Take off his shoes and socks, and you go on to cook. Right? Baby number one." He's accustomed to being pampered. So he expects you're pregnant, you're sick, but you come home. He still wants his newspapers and uh, coffee or tea and his shoes taken off with slippers. Amen. And you are annoyed. I'm sick. What, what is what's it wrong with you? Right? Then baby comes and I don't have the time because I have to see about baby. Baby number two. And he wants to be pampered. Baby number three, not understanding the dynamics change. So even though I start off needing something, a particular thing which was high up on my list, because these things happen, the dynamics change. All right, the dynamics change. Uh, what about if both parties are employed? Because traditionally, how we were trained, people in my age group, was that the man worked outside the home. And that's why I had to be this homemaker to do all of those things because they didn't consider the fact that I was employed as well. We did the same job. We were both teachers. So I'm expected to teach just like you and do all of that still, which sometimes is not physically possible. The man was supposed to be the provider, but then we have now in our modern day society where women work for much more money than men. 
So how is he the provider? How does that work itself out? So what I'm saying is that there are a whole lot of dynamics because the man was supposed to give you stuff and buy stuff for you. Here, I'm making two, three, four times the money you're making. You don't have to buy me anything. So we have to know. Each couple will now have to not generalize, but sit down together and communicate, observe, listen, to find out what are the needs of your partner and how these needs are changing. Let's talk about how to recognize what the needs are. And I have a book here that I'm going to look at. It's called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Now, this book, most people are familiar with the content of the book. And simply put, I talk about this all the time. In this book, Mr. Chapman is talking about the five basic needs of human beings in relationships. And it goes across the board. It doesn't have to be just husband and wife. It could be children, uh, friends, uh, and that kind of thing. And the five are words of affirmation, receiving gifts, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. Now, I, I, I mean, I don't have the time to go into all that was written here, but I could tell you what they are. There are some people, for them, words of affirmation are very important. The Bible says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. A soft answer, the Bible says, and Proverbs again, uh, keeps away wrath. And I have experienced that a lot of times, that um, if I answered in the correct way, then it would not have had a, a quarrel, one argument. Just the wrong answer, the wrong way that you say it, your manner of, of responding or that kind of a thing could create a situation. So words of affirmation, there are some children who parents are puzzled because those parents consider themselves really good providers. They give them everything, good education, every single thing that child could desire, experiences that they could desire they have. And the child looks at a parent and said, I hate you, you never loved me. What do you mean? Simply because sometimes such parents are so busy providing things for the child, never took the time to say, good job, well done, congratulations. That was good. Um, you improved in math. You know, from the time uh, uh, we get the, the, the report card, uh, the child didn't come first or in the first three or in the first five, and we are upset and angry, we express it. But we never take the chance of realize that that child really tried. And I tell people, if the child, if you tried, and that's the best you could give me, you know, I have to accept that. Uh, uh, and let's see how we could improve on your work. Words of affirmation are important to some people. And so for that child, all she wanted her father to say, I love you. You're beautiful. And she would have been fine. And for some people, some women, words of affirmation are important. So you are saying you're doing a whole lot of things and you're frustrated because it seems as though, uh, you know, it's falling on deaf ears or it's not appreciated, then perhaps you should find out what it is that makes this woman tick. Is it words of affirmation? When's the last time you say, I love you? And I know most men will say, but you know I love you. You know, look, I give everything. Look, look, look at anything you want, you get. You know, I'm not going to tell you anybody I know who said that, but, you know, generally I could hear that some men saying that, you know. Yeah, but I still want you to say, I love you. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel secure when you say you love me. And I uh, keep loving me uh, long after I, I, I lose all the nice uh, curves and things that I used to have. You know, I want, I want to feel secure because many times at a certain age, women, their bodies are changing. They've had children and some people don't age as well as others. And you want to feel that that person appreciates you for who you are. Now, generally, we appreciate our men. Whether they get bald or not, we love you. You know, the belly big, big like ours, we love you. You know, <laughs> whatever shape and size you come in, we love you. And, and we, you know, so we want that. So we're going down to receive and give. Some people, as I said, are things people. And that's who they are. Listen to me. You want them to be happy? Give them stuff. And uh, if you are a man like that, well, brother, you make sure. Um, I can't tell you by any means necessary because <laughs> you might go to jail. Don't do that. But find ways to supply the needs of this person because that's what the person wants. Uh, some people are happy to get gifts on occasion. And sometimes I, I find, that in my case, creativity is important. It's not, I mean, I reach the stage where I could tell you, it doesn't matter if I get a gift, you have all kind of stuff. Because you're talking about 42 years of marriage, come on, you get everything that you could possibly get. 
you know, and if I didn't get it from him, I buy it myself. And so gifts don't really excite me that much or anything. So a creative gift, something small, that that person use imagination, something that, uh, uh, you know, we go in somewhere and we walk in and my eye caught something. I didn't say anything, I looked at it. He recognized that I, my eye caught this particular thing. The next thing he goes and he gets it. That will excite me because it's important, right? For example, like um, certain things that I like, um, I love certain kinds of fruits. And he knows that when the boat comes from the islands, uh, he will pass somewhere in town and they would have this nice big fruit and he will bring it for me. That's something that will excite me. It is not expensive. However, it shows he's thinking about me. I don't know if he knows when the boat come in, but whenever those boats come, he's going to find himself down by the sea, wherever, uh, and the vendors are selling and will bring it. And that's gift. So gift giving, uh, for some people, I can't talk for everybody, may not always be something pricey and expensive. Although, if you say you value me, at my stage, after 40 years of marriage, he had to spend some money on me. You know, don't bring no kind of inferior thing for me. You understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> you know, uh, despite the fact that it, it, uh, I will take simple things, but those are creative gifts, which is very important. Uh, it seems as though we're going to have to continue this uh, next time. I thought that I would be able to finish it, but we're going to talk about um, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. And I, I just thought that I would say to you that women and children spell lover t-i-m-e don't tell me you love me and you're too busy to spend time with me you know time children want parents to spend time with them and that's why they have a problem when we are busy doing all kinds of things providing for them and there is not this uh, time spent to express emotional love and caring and so we have to continue this um, we're going to talk about it so you should know observe your wife think about what it is that she wants and I, I i like to talk why not talk about it say to her tell me what it is you want what, you know how would you like me to express my love for you what am i not doing tell me specifically um what i should do because when you tell me um you don't love me then uh, i'm confused because to my man i love you i'm doing all of this i'm sacrificing uh you know so tell me what you want and what I've found many times, you know, as spouses, we say, you don't love me. And when the person says, tell me what you want, you know, you ain't know what to say. You, you know, you can't even, you and all don't know what you want because you're confused yourself, <laughs> you know. But uh, it's important to find out what it is that that person needs. In my mind, we need all of these things from time to time. But there are some people, some of these needs are, are higher up on the totem pole than others. And there are some people who just like hugging and touching, just, they, they call them touchy-feely people, you know, I mean, they, you could see that they want to touch you, and sometimes I find that person kind of a little, you know, you don't know me, they'll be touching, <laughs> you know, and you're trying to kind of have this pleasant look on your face when I really want to tell the person, don't touch me, you know, because they're touching you in a kind of a way, and holding you, and, you know, and I don't think the person, sometimes they're not aware Remember this particular person and was a man and he used to make me really uncomfortable. You know, I'm saying, why are you you're too close and you know what I mean? And he's kind of bubblish in personality and he even noticing that I am not comfortable with that. And so you have to know who that person is. And uh, we, as I close, if you, even if you are not touchy-feely and you're married to somebody like that, you have to practice to receive it. Because you can't have a spouse and tell him, well, you go on the end of your bed, don't touch me. I want to sleep. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, you have to get accustomed to people touching you and holding you and feeling you, especially if it's somebody who is uh, tend to be that way. No, I really hope I helped you in some way. And the next time we are going to um, continue this, looking at how to, to find out what are the needs of uh, those loved ones. Now remember what I said to you, not just husbands and wives. What about your children? Uh, you know, you may have five children at home and you know, each one may want something different. 
There's one child who wants to be touched. There's one child who needs affirmation. There's one child who you have to give little gifts and tokens. And that is what will make that child pro produce. You know, some children, oh boy, if they know mommy, you're going to buy me something. I mean, they come in full sentence. <laughs> and some children, listen, you can buy them what you want. That is not going to help them. We have to find out what are the needs of those people in our lives and what is the best way that we can meet those needs. by Donna Lisa, Donna Lisa Phillips from Expo 2017. Donna Lisa, tell me what has happened with Faces by Donna Lisa since Expo 2017. Well, Francine, we have been quite busy at Faces by Donna Lisa's. At the Expo 2017, apart from the makeup aspect, we took the opportunity to launch our skincare line. And at that point, we introduced three soaps and two body butters and one face scrub. And from then to now, we now have 10 soaps, six body butters, and two face scrubs. That's fantastic. Yes. Tell us, what would you like to introduce to us today? Well, at Expo SB 2017, we had a lot of complaints from the men that there were no products that we didn't cater for them. So now we introduce two male body butters. So gentlemen, I am inviting you to Expo SB 2018. Be sure to visit the Faces by Donna Lisa's booth and get your body butters. See you at Expo. Have you ever said to yourself, I really wish I can understand the Bible better. I want to communicate with God better. 
I want to be able to share my faith with others. Have you ever said, I'm reading the Bible, but I do not really understand it? Well, if you have ever said any of those things, I have really good news for you. My name is Gemma Duncan. My husband and I, Pastor Vivian Duncan, are the pastors of Divine Destiny Worship Center. And we have what we call School of the Bible. We started since 2014, and I'm going to give you a little rundown as to what School of the Bible is about and how we can facilitate you in fulfilling the needs that you have expressed. School of the Bible is a one-year course that runs from January to December. Every Tuesday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then we have four all-day quarterly sessions, one Saturday every three months. Inclusive in all of this, we have movies. Uh, our main course material is the Bible. The Bible is the one and only resource book that you have to have. There are other resource materials that we will have on offer that you could choose to get or not get. If you choose, then you have to order those materials. But other than that, there are seven manuals that we use. And these seven manuals, you'll be going to see them on the screen, and I'll give you a little rundown as to what they are. The first manual, manual number one, is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Manual number two contains the historical books from Joshua to Esther. Manual number three, the books of poetry from Job to Song of Solomon. Manual number four are the books of prophecy. And the books of prophecy, they are divided into two sections, major prophets from Isaiah to Daniel and the minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi. Now, when you come to the school, we'll talk about why they are considered major and minor. Uh, manual number five, the New Testament books now, the books of history, the four Gospels from Matthew to John. Manual number six are what we call the Pauline epistles. The epistles written by Apostle Paul from Romans to Philemon. And then manual number seven are the general epistles and they have a variety of authors and the book of Revelation. Uh, the one prophetic book in the New Testament. The manuals are simply written and user-friendly. They are easy to use and you can use them as a tool for study in the future. This program is designed to meet your need to simply understand the Bible better. The Bible is the only test, as I said. Other resources are optional and are available on request. Ask for a brochure at 633-3780. And you'll see the number scrolling across the, the screen. The brochure will contain all the information that you may need. We are now open for registration.
I don't want you to ever forget that with God, everything is possible. God bless you real good.